Well, I have a wonderful electronic invention I want you to see. It, it looks something like this. Welcome to the CTO Studio. I'm your host, Etienne de Bruin. The CTO Studio is where we chat with CTOs building amazing products with incredible teams. Have you chatted with a CTO lately? Welcome to the show this week. Show for CTOs by CTO types. Phil Borland, welcome to the show. Thank you. Do you have pets? Pets? Pets. I don't even P -E -T -S. know. P-E-T-S. I don't Oh, pets. Pets. <laughs> <laughs> the, the South African accent. Uh, yes, I have several. I have a rabbit, I have a fish, and I have five chickens. Wowzers. And they all live in the same cage? They uh, do not. <laughs> do I don't you know if you know that fish... Like more aquatic. Well, you could have a fish bowl inside of a chicken coop. We could. Let's see that on. Uh, see that on. Let's Google and that later. And do you do you eat the eggs? Oh yes, they're amazing. They're amazing. We have that as well. One every morning. Um, do you produce um, pet bowls? <laughs> I do pr produce pet bowls. They're on Amazon. They're actually amazing, by the way. My dog thanks you for it. <laughs> Fantastic. So that's an experiment in Amazon fulfillment services. Yep. How's that going? Well, they're up there and uh, about to launch a marketing campaign and can't drive some traffic. That's awesome. There. So I met Phil a couple of years ago when you were director of engineering at Plural Site. You yes. actually you moved from Utah to San Diego for, for yeah, this I got job. A, I got this promotion and, okay. and part of that was moving to San Diego. And tell me about your time at Pluralsight. So my time at Pluralsight was amazing. It was kind of this opportunity to kind of start up this, uh, this new office and uh, kind of being able to be there, be part of a larger company, but um, at the same time, you know, be able to kind of have a lot of kind of creative control over how to, how to kind of work with this office. And I was with uh, um, a fellow named Ben and kind of the two of us were kind of like the, the people that were setting this office up. I think I saw Ben doing Tesla YouTube videos now. Probably isn't everything, yeah. So um, what's it like moving from Utah to San Diego? Well, I mean, I'm a Southern California by birth and okay. grew up in LA, so uh, it was like coming home. And before Pluralsight? So before Pluralsight, it was a bunch of little companies. My first job was at Discover. That was my only, I would say, like corporate experience other than these kind of like smaller companies along the way. And, and did you go to the university? Uh, yeah, so I went to... Uh, Westminster, which is a Salt Lake City college, there's about five campuses. It's not the English one. And then uh, I went got my master's at Colorado State. And what did you do your master's in? Uh, these are both computer science. And did you what did you focus on with your master's? Uh, so I focused on kind of software engineering uh, mainly. So at our um, O Triple One CTO conference, you spoke a bit about. Um, breaking on breaking up the monolithic app. Um, you know, I uh, if you don't mind, we can talk about that a bit. Yeah, I let's think do it. a lot of. Um, I had an interesting conversation with a founder the other day, who who consulted with a software engineer, senior software engineer, who extolled the virtues of the monolithic app and and was actually counselling this founder to not try and SOA the thing and microservices the thing, but to just stick with the monolithic app. Um, which had me thinking a bit because I thought, I feel like it's almost always the wrong answer to stay monolithic. Well, I think it's the wrong answer to stay monolithic. I think it's the right answer to start monolithic. And usually when I like talk architecturally, I like to think about like, you should be doing things two or three times before you start breaking things out. Is you just don't understand the uh, where you sub, you know where your abstraction should be, and so yeah, if you're going to a founder and saying like I need to start up a company, start out as a monolith, and uh, you know you need to you know you really the reason to break out is to kind of lower communication costs between teams, and if you're sitting there with one team, maybe you just split into two teams, your communication cost is very low, and you're not really going to see the the benefits of of kind of splitting it out. But I, I usually think when you hit that third team, so maybe around your 12th developer, somewhere between 10 and 14 developers, 
that's the time to start thinking about this. Interesting. So you're you're seeing it more as a function of team efficiency than uh, scale, maybe? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. I mean, I think there's lots of great ways, uh, especially, I mean, you know, you have these you know, you have these big companies, Google and Facebook. They're they keep pushing these scale envelopes, and I think it trickles down to um, you know, what is it RDS? It can support 16 terabytes these days in a in a relational database. Like, I mean, that's that's more than a lot of us are ever going to see. Um, and so, I, I think a lot of the scaling arguments uh, for microservices are, are are less than they were. But I think the um, the hard problems are not the technology. The technology is the easy stuff. The hard part is the, the human interactions, and human beings are tough. And to me, breaking out of like self-contained services, which I advocate, is um, mostly, first of all, about uh, solving communication costs. And the fact that it's kind of go- geeky and cool is just kind of like a, a bonus. So, um, uh, so you're a fan of a service-oriented architecture, but actually maybe more of a self-contained oriented architecture? Well, I think service-oriented architecture is a very um, high-level concept. And I think self-contained services is, or self-contained systems is a, uh, it's kind of more, um, kind of a subset of that. And um, it really kind of advocates keeping your front end and your back end and uh, and your database as close to each other and giving teams kind of their own code bases and their own databases. And then using some kind of data replication or some kind of a uh, you know, calling into other people's APIs, um, you know, in order to to kind of cross those boundaries. You can have uh, small communication boundaries between other teams and lots of room to innovate on your own team. So perhaps, uh, I mean, this is fascinating. Um, perhaps give us a bit of a definition of self-contained systems. Yeah, totally. Because um, you're... You're, you're talking about breaking up the system, not necessarily in the more intuitive web app, database app, um, you know, you're talking a little more about uh, self-contained, which means any level of, let's say in this case, the MVC, it's, it's really contained in its own system. Yeah, they're definitely vertical slices of the system. They're not horizontal slices. Um, you know, although, you know, the horizontal slices exist in each of the uh, self-contained systems and there's different teams that'll kind of like divide that up. So it's not like you can't have a front end developer and a back end developer. They're just contained within a team. They're not spread out across different teams. And then I would say, um, I usually think about this like heavily influenced from uh, uh, the domain driven design kind of concepts. And I kind of look at, you know, sometimes they'll even say like a self-contained system, you think about it the same way you'd think of a bounded context is you kind of look for these seams natural seams in your in your system. And a lot of times you can kind of key off that because your language changes. Um, you know, I think about this entity over in this one area and I think about it over in the other area and I start talking about it differently. And you can start saying like, well, maybe I should kind of divide those things up and kind of separate the teams out. And, uh, you know, kind of, um, you know, just kind of build up something. And a lot of times, you know, what, what you're finding out is when you start talking about things differently, you start interacting with them differently. And then really they end up being different concepts. And you know, there's there's kind of an there's kind of a strong ID. So basically, you know, um, in domain driven design, you have this entity and it's defined by its ID and not by its attributes. Whereas like when you think think of like an object, we think about, you know, here's the attributes of my object. So this is kind of like so if I have like uh, you know, in Veo in our world, we have like a trip, and I look at um, this trip is gonna exist outside of the software system we're building. It's going to exist in multiple manifestations within, and it's going to continue outside the other end of our software system. And so there's this, we need to kind of have this identification that ties this all together. But that doesn't mean I need to kind of focus on a single database table or a collection or an object. I, I can break that into, you know, maybe I'm, I have a fulfillment trip and maybe I have a dispatch trip and, and they become kind of separate concepts, but they're tied together with this kind of identification mm, thread. Mm, okay. So from Pluralsight, you moved to Veo. Yes. Um, can you tell us in a few words or like concepts what Veo does? Yeah. So um, what happens is the federal government has these Medicare and Medicaid things. And so they're, they're fantastic programs that are dealing with kind of elderly, you know, our grandparents, um, and then some of the poorer populations and kind of giving them access to healthcare. They're fantastic programs. And one of the things um, that these two populations kind of struggle with is, is getting to their appointments, right? They might not own cars, their cars might not be reliable, uh, but you know, they, they need 
you know, critical medical care that will kind of keep them out of hospitals, such as dialysis or other things like that. And so what we do is we provide transportation to these people um, as part of these programs, uh, no cost to them. It's, it's paid through the Medicare and Medicaid programs. And we get them to their medical transport, you know, their medical appointments and get them the, the care that they really need. So um, uh, it's sort of a gig economy thing. So people. So I, I hear that a lot, right? Uh, like everybody's like, are you the Uber of like. Uh, I didn't of, say Uber, I, bro. I know you didn't say that. You would say, you know, are you the lift of, of I didn't medical say lift, bro. <laughs> I said gig economy. So um, really what happens is we're kind of a, a more holistic um uh, uh, you know, attack on that program is we kind of talk about like modes of transportation and um, you know, so some people are getting there, um, you know, they might be in a hospice situation where we're going to reimburse the hospice um, to kind of get them out there or, you know, reimburse the relative um, kind of on a straight mileage reimbursement. We might uh, be in a position where they're going to take public transportation. And we're going to reimburse them for that transportation. Um, obviously there's like a lot of specialized things in medical, right? If they need an oxygen tank or if they need kind of a stretcher or if they need like a specialized wheelchair. Interesting. So let's, yeah, it's, it's more, it's, yeah, okay, it's more no, than just, that's yeah. interesting. Okay. Um, so let's say I need to get to the hospital and I'm going to use the bus. Yes. Um, I am obviously paying the bus fare when I get on the bus, right? No. So, uh, for instance, Connecticut right now, we're doing a lot of public transportation. We will mail out the bus ticket or token or whatever it is, that transit system, ahead of time. So, you know, there's nothing out of your pocket. Oh, so you plan, so you plan it then? So I sign up at Veo. No, no, no. So, oh, so Veo signs up the Connecticut public transport system, or how does that work? So, um, you know, it depends. So, you know, I wish like you know our state governments are are totally all over the place, and that's fine. I mean, like we get a lot of freedoms out of that. But um, when it kind of comes to bringing systems together, it depends on the market. But basically, we we think about it from the members' perspective, from the from the patients' perspective. It's like they need to get on that bus and. Th- we're not going to have them pay any money to get on that bus because that's that's what we do is is manage this pool of of federal or state money um, and and use that to get this transportation. So it's going to be no cost to you to get on that bus. So if I need to get to the hospital and I have to use the bus, um, am I using a Veo mobile app? So first of all, our patients. So we're doing non-emergency medical transportation. Yes. yes. Um, if you need to go to the hospital, you might want to call nine one one and get an ambulance, <laughs> right? That's that's not really um, that's not really the kind of the the yeah. point of this, right? So generally, these are people that have appointments. Um, maybe with, you went with, to the emergency room. You need some follow ups. We'll okay. handle your follow up appointments. Okay. But but yeah, I don't want somebody who has a critical emergency um, waiting for a bus pass in the mail or even taking a <laughs> no, bus. No, no. But I think. But yes. Okay. Okay. So do you do? Um, uh, do can people sign up as drivers in the Veo ecosystem? Yes. Yeah, so one of those four mode transportations are um, are you know we call it the IDP, the independent provider. Um, so basically, you know, we have these providers that might have fleets of vehicles, and then you could think of an independent provider as a as a provider with one vehicle. Interesting. Okay. And so um, let's talk a little bit about the 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 app or the technology. What can you talk us? Can you walk us through? Maybe let's get let's geek out a little bit. Like yeah. what what um, technologies are you using? Um, what like what's the makeup of your engineering teams? Uh, I think you're the VP of of engineering. What's well, the director? Director of engineering. So so maybe just let's get a little dirty on the tech stack the makeup of your teams and then yeah. maybe some process that you're using to sort of streamline development. Right. So, um, so I've been there, I think about five months or so and, um, it came in, it was a totally a .NET shop. Um, still a lot of .NET code and it's really good. Uh, we brought in a couple of, uh, uh node JS developers. And so, you know, we're not going to like rewrite our system, but you know, there's parts as we're kind of peeling out these self-contained systems, there's opportunities to kind of have some kind of, uh, language diversity. So we're bringing some of that in there. Um, you know, a lot of this is, um, you know, we had this kind of self-contained system architecture over plural site that we're kind of bringing in here. That's part of the. Can, can you just? Here. Can I just? Can you give me an example of? So, what monolithic components inside of Veo have you identified as candidates for self-contained systems? Uh, I mean, I'm thinking yeah. of things like login and SSO and all that stuff. Or yeah. 
So, um, so the first thing, the first self-contained service that we built last quarter was kind of a greenfield project. We decided to kind of go into facilities and help them kind of like understand which patients were kind of coming into there. So that was that was an easy win. Um, this quarter, we're looking at um, pulling out some kind of um, let's see, it's you know, it's part of kind of like the uh, um, kind of the routing, like how we kind of present um, trips for providers to kind of like accept um, and. That part of it we're kind of pulling out of the monolith that's that's kind of our project for this quarter and so it's really you just sort of do a little bit of a time and you don't sit here and, and move from like monolith to, to self-contain overnight and then within that um you know since we're on a dot uh, net stack with azure we're using service bus uh you know third quarter we'll be looking at kind of kafka and getting something a little bit more industrial strength in there but yeah um you know there's nothing wrong with kind of starting off small with kind of like a, a service bus which is kind of like rabbit mq for those not familiar with that side but um, yeah, and then um, you know, kind of bring in new databases uh, and uh, a lot of SQL Server and uh, kind of going on back there, and then see what other kind of critical technologies. Yeah, so basically, kind of a, a standard .NET stack. Um, we're bringing in Kafka this quarter. No, I'm sorry, not Kafka. Kubernetes this quarter, mm -hmm. and so we're uh, we've written our first uh, that facility portals that we that I talked about. We're just moving that over to .NET Core. We'll be kind of accelerating our, our .NET development to kind of switch over to .NET Core as it kind of makes sense. And, uh, and are you in uh, Azure? Yes. And so teams-wise, you you have what? Do you have so, so we have five teams. Five teams. So um, with what is that, about 16 developers. So we're generally kind of three to four developers on a team. And um, in one of those, we've kind of carved off as an infrastructure team, which are kind of working on um, the Kubernetes project. Um, actually, you kind of mentioned auth. Um, it will be, we won't be, uh, we'll be kind of like outsourcing that, um, which I think is a great idea. I mean, you don't want to screw that part of it up. And there's wonderful people out there that know a lot about that. Um, and then, so that they're kind of be able to kind of give kind of like the, the infrastructure type projects like Kafka and that's those and Kubernetes and that type of stuff. So let's, um, uh, so do you? So let's talk about the process a little bit. Do you do those teams? Um, are you mob programming at all? So I have one team that's doing mob programming. Um, I'm a big believer in strong team, um, like ownership of process and of code, um, and I think that kind of fits well. You know, kind of with self-contained services. You know, kind of it's a natural. You kind of see those two tied together. But um, so one of the teams has decided to mob. I have another team which is doing pair programming. Um, and then um, the infrastructure team kind of works on more kind of um, uh, disparate tasks. There's kind of a lot of DevOps going on over there, which which could be paired or mobbed, but it's not right now. And then there's uh, two other smaller teams which uh, which are kind of doing pull requests. And did you did you leave it up to the teams to decide how they wanted to work? I.e., one team said mob, one team said pair, or like or or is it something that you're actively trying to introduce? No, no, no. I think um, I think what I see is that, and I saw this. This was my experience at Plural Site too. Is you know the best way to kind of make these kind of changes is not to kind of like top down them or or to kind of influence them, but more to kind of say like, hey, you know, let's get a team that wants to experiment with the mob and let's go support them. And and here's a team that wants to experiment with pairs. Let's support them. And these other teams are you know they want to stay with the pull requests. And I might mandate that uh, you have to at least do pull requests. Like we can't have like um, developers just doing whatever they want to like you know even senior developers can use kind of a, a check on on what's going on we all get tired or you know you know whatever lazy i mean it's just kind of human nature so kind of having that check in there is important but beyond that what they decide to do their check on i think what'll happen is um you know as the teams that are pairing start picking up their velocity and the and the teams that are mobbing start picking up their velocity those just options will become attractive to other developers to other teams and if not all teams choose it, like I'm okay with that too. And then what is your relation? So all five of these teams report to you, right? So I'm bringing up a, a manager right now who's kind of uh, um, taking one of the teams right now, but okay. uh, all the other developers. And then do you have some sort of um, stand up with all of them once a week or once a day? Or do you, how so, do you manage that? What's, give me some insight into some yeah. of your process. Yeah. So the cadences are the teams have individual stand ups. Uh, I usually, uh, don't attend them. So we have a tech lead on every team. And my philosophy is like tech leads are technical people that have a few extra duties. It's not, uh, it's not like a mini manager. I know some other teams do that. And I think that's fine. That's just my philosophy. I'd rather 
um, have them be really good engineers that just have a few extra things to do. So they'll, um, so I kind of trust them on the, um, you know, on the standups, right? They got product managers. There's lots of smart people there kind of keep things on track. Um, and I do kind of like a weekly, uh, kind of engineering. Um, I don't know if I call a standup. It's more like an engineering kind of checkpoint. It's really short. It's like 15 minutes. Every once in a while we have a little longer one, but I just try to bring things from the business and kind of bring context in. That's into with there. everybody. That's all the engineers. Mm. And, yes. um, what, what, so you report into the CTO, right? Yes. So what what is what is your cadence with the CTO? So we have weekly one on ones, um, and then I have weekly one on. I mean, I'm sorry, I had bi weekly one on ones with my tech leads, and then a, a monthly kind of training meeting with our with my tech leads. And do you with your CTO just talk a bit about that relationship? Are you uh, do you guys are you what do you look to your CTO for? So there's a lot of strategy and there's a lot of context. Is so. Uh, to me, in a healthy executive team, what's going on is, is they're spending a lot of time talking about strategy. Um, you know, I want I want like top level metrics from them. Um, you know, you know, in our cases, you know, we we pay a lot of attention to kind of like the the cost per trip, uh, the cost per mile, and like you know that they're in the perfect position to kind of look over the whole business and be like, what which one of these things are kind of like really operationally really important. So when they kind of bring those down to me, I can kind of bring those to the team, and we can kind of work on. Um, you know, breaking those down into kind of like things that the team can actually affect. It's really hard to get these high level business, right? They're hard to reason about, they're hard to move. Uh, but if you can kind of chain them to things that are easy to move, right? So like, you know, I need my CTO to do that type of stuff. Yeah. So um, what you're, what I hear you saying is you're looking for sort of, st- you're looking for strategic leadership from your CTO, but you like for it to be backed by, by data, and, and me- metrics that, that you feel um, you can sort of believe or sort of or understand. In right. other words, in other words, what I, it's not like hand-waving strategy. It's more, hey, this is the data that is driving our, our sort of strategic direction, and then you can take that and turn it into tangibles for your team. Right, yeah. I mean, so, you know, if, it, you kind of, and this is kind of like the you, um, a lot of times you know we have these conversations. It's like you know we got this pile of money, right? This multiple millions of dollars that are going to this tech team. Like, what, 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 what? Let what the are these record reflect doing? that Vaya pays their tech team multiple millions of dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't get in trouble for that. But um, but I don't know. You know, we're we're, we're a six hundred person company, right? It's um, the and the tech team goes beyond um, just engineers, right? So this is kind of a large chunk of the organization. Does that include a call center? The, so there's a call center, but that's not part of the tech team. Okay, uh, right? that's on the is that part of the six hundred? Yes. And so, who's in charge of the uh, so the call centers are mostly s- s- customer support or? Well, so we really kind of two things, right? So we have, um, you know, again, with these populations, it's right. If you're kind of like elderly, you might not right quite get the the smartphone, right? So you're not out there like on your app, you know, calling Aveo on your app or something like that. Um, you know, you're calling in to, to kind of book schedules and stuff like that. So we have a, we have a whole part of a, um, you know, calls, we have multiple call centers, right? State governments, Connecticut wants Connecticut residents mm-hmm. to talk to Connecticut mm-hmm. residents. Um, when, and that's understandable. And, um, the, uh, right. So you have kind of, you know, half, you know, this, this large arm of people kind of like booking trips on behalf of patients that are calling in on phones and the other half, or I shouldn't say it's not half and half, but like the other kind of portion is, um, um, kind of running the trips as they're in progress. Right. You know, he, you know, I'm trying to pick up this person. I can't find them or the person's like, oh, my ride's not here. Or maybe, you know, there's a flat tire, all the, any things that can kind of go wrong during this process. And so those are really what these people are doing so are you solving the traveling salesman <laughs> so i mean obviously yeah there's 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 routing issues and we're you know we're moving things around and uh um it's really exciting because i think what we have is is a is a fundamentally different than kind of like a, a generic ride share you know what what we kind of think of as ride share where it's like okay um you know i have to like guess at this capacity and i have to um, then try to optimize based on my guess about this capacity. Whereas we kind of have more of a, a knowledge of our capacity. People are booking trips in advance, right? If you're on dialysis, you're on dialysis for, you know, you're not getting the off dialysis, right? That's just your life from now on. And, um, you know, um, and so we know that person's going every, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. 
and and a, and a large number of our our trips are exactly that way. It's it's more um, the uncertainty comes in on the on the pickup times, but we we still have a window, right? We know you went to dialysis. Dialysis takes this much time. Okay, so you're more so yeah. so the the scheduling of trips is is a big deal. The scheduling of trips is good, but I think we have like large um, advantages over on the routing side because the more information you can feed into your algorithms, the better results they're going to yeah. give you. And then the more accurate your scheduling and resource management yes, exactly. of, or transportation management is. Yep. So um, very quickly, Kubernetes. Your, can you talk about that a bit? I, I mostly, mostly I would like to, in the context of CEO founder slash tech co-founder is hearing about Kubernetes all day, every day. They've only just managed to understand containers. Mm-hmm. Um, what would you? What advice would you give to a a, a CEO founder slash tech co founder on when and how and why to use Kubernetes? Right. So first of all, you know when we talk about VMs, right? That was to me like you know containers are 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 the the next revolution past VMs. When you talk about VMs, you don't like that's that's not enough context, right? I need AWS to spin up a VM in, or I need right Azure to spin up a VM, and I can't just like magically make one appear out of nowhere. And and it's the same thing in the container world. Is um, is it's different that I can kind of create a a v, you know you know there's you know, I can create them on my developers workstations, but when it kind of comes to deployment, they don't just magically appear out of nowhere. And so you have something to kind of deploy them on. And Kubernetes is really kind of showing up as the as the leader, right? They have some competitors, but my you know by and far they have the mind share i mean when people like goldman sachs run kubernetes like it's it's here right so kubernetes as a way to deploy containers yeah so they call it an orchestration framework but really kind of when you start multiplying the number of services you have there's all kinds of like complexities that come and um and it's just going to waste your time if you have to manage those complexities so get a platform that manages all those complexities. How, how do they talk to each other? How's the network work? I mean, we can go off on, on tons of like little problems and uh, a lot of those things just get solved by just kind of going there. And then second of all, you know, we have, if you're on Azure or if you're on, um, you know, Google Cloud right now, it's all managed, right? I don't have to spend a lot of, I don't need to hire a DevOps person to spin up Kubernetes, just one of those. And AWS has it in uh, um, preview mode right now and uh, or kind of a beta or early whatever I can't remember what they call it, but you know it's like a preview mode. So I would say you know in the next six months, I, you know I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know their their timeline, but it's coming soon, and so it'll be ubiquitous across. So basically, uh, yeah. you're just so. So the question is like, why would you if you're going to do containers? Why would you not do Kubernetes? And so so let me ask you about that. Um, if I am about to start developing my MVP, um, or I'm at the very early stage of app development do i would you recommend that you just start with the containerization of your app just from the get go or do you think you should only do that when it's necessary well so i always like i'm very you know cognizant of the challenges of like starting up a business like if you don't have you know your product market fit or you're out there struggling and you don't know where your where your next round of funding is coming from like you need to be like really scrappy and and things like heroku are like fantastic for people in that situation, like I wouldn't, I wouldn't go crazy, right? You need to get your product out. Uh, but I think there's that turning point where you start going, like, okay, now you know we're we know this is coming out. We got our funding. You know, things are like we can't waste time. Like, I mean, we're not in like you're not living fat. But at that time, I think you start making more deliberate si- si- um, kind of decisions. And it's the same thing too. It's like you know, if I'm in this monolith stage, and that's what I'm going to start out with as I'm kind of building up my developer, right? The the value of Kubernetes isn't. And, and containerization, I don't think is as strong. Although it's possible your developers just are in the habit of using containers on their desktop. And um, I would say that might change your equation where you might want to just drop those into production because they're already, they've been created already. Yeah, it's almost like um, like unit testing. I mean, you can, you can decide from the get-go to be scrappy and neglect it, or you can reinforce that culture even as a dev team of one. And just say, well, that's that's the culture we have. But I, I agree with you that if that comes at the expense of just getting it out ASAP so that you can test it against the market, then then why do it? Yeah, I mean, that's this is really early stage, right? Yeah, I want yeah. to be clear. I'm not talking about like you know. No, no, I get it. Yeah. So we only have a few minutes left. What um, 
what are you what what tech is exciting you right now or what are you are you reading anything are you putting vehicles into space or what <laughs> what, what uh what what tech is exciting you right now well i actually read an article this morning in the atlantic about um you know kind of t- they were kind of talking about tla plus and kind of this kind of um you know, on can, on your critical systems, maybe kind of getting a little bit better, kind of getting a design language around that. And uh, it's really early. I, I can't really talk intelligently about it, but you know, it's it's pretty exciting um, to kind of have this maybe um, mathematically spec, you know, uh, uh, specs that you can kind of like go into your critical code and and put around it and kind of prove the correctness of it. Hmm. Uh, so TLA plus. Yes. What is that? So it's it's like a specification language. It kind of looks basically you kind of take mathematical models. It's not like UML. Uh, no, it's not like UML. No, uh, and, and in fact, it, it it looks like that uh, um, that math book that you didn't really like back in you know college. Um, but at the same time, it's uh, um, it's kind of fascinating because you're able to kind of like um, put put up this model in this mathematical language and hit run on it and kind of prove whether it's kind of like sound or not like that. And so mm-hmm. then you can go back there and say like, okay, I found this unsound part of my logic. I can fill in the soundness. And all of a sudden now my spec is mathematical instead of like stream of consciousness from like bullet points that, that are like flawed all over the place. Fascinating. Can you use that to test the complexity of your code as well? I'm not sure. Like I said, I mean, this is like, yeah, you asked yeah. me, what am I looking at today? <laughs> this is what I looked at today. What... Uh uh, anything else? Are you uh, any books you want to recommend? Uh, any anything uh, for aspiring directors of engineering out there? So I just read the Cal Newport book. Um, so good that they can't ignore you, and it's based off a of kind of a Steve Martin quote. Um, where basically they kind of put out this idea that like just go be you know he, you know here's some strategies for being the best that you can be, and instead of saying like hey. You know, I want to go out there and um, I want to make a name for myself and I don't really know what I'm doing. Uh, you can kind of approach it the opposite way and just become so good that it's just like nobody can ignore you. With those words, thank you, Phil. Thank you. Have you chatted with a CTO lately? Hi, thank you for listening to the CTO Studio. If you don't mind, take a quick second and please rate and review the show. It helps us a lot. Go to thectostudio.com for more information on what we're doing at 7CTOs. We also have a video or two for you that could be a helpful resource for you as you're managing your company. So thank you for listening.